A secret hoard, lost for centuries. Not gold, not silver, but steel. The mystery of the Cassian sword group is ongoing. The end of a war, the last battle to be fought, a final stand to be made. The Battle of Castillon was absolutely catastrophic for the English. The wreck of an army. Armour, weapons, swords. Any more bits? The investigation of an enduring mystery. A forgotten treasure. Undisturbed, undiscovered, until now. The swords of Castillon. The medieval world, the 5th to the 15th century. Tim Sutherland is one of Britain's most experienced archaeologists. He and a team of specialists try to understand medieval life by exploring the realm of the medieval dead. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man trying to keep his family alive. Archaeologically speaking, we can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You couldn't help almost look through their eyes thinking, what did they see? How did they die? This story is one of the most remarkable in the world of arms and armor. It's truly epic in scope, from a medieval battlefield to the prestige sail rooms of the 21st century. And in between, all the plot twists a thriller writer could imagine. Except it all really happened. For more than four decades, it's created a trail of rumor and guesswork, hearsay and intrigue. Now we'll delve into that world. We'll examine the clues, the stories, the facts, and the extraordinary sequence of events behind the mystery of the Swords of Castillon. One hundred kilometers north of Bordeaux, an exhibition was held in the Chateau de Pont. Called La Guerre au Moyen Âge, the Hundred Years' War, the catalogue showed a photograph of a medieval sword. Of the sword's origin, almost nothing was said other than it was from somewhere in France. To people outside the international world of arms and armour, it was just another old sword. Another piece destined for sale to a museum or collector. To those in the know, it was a big deal. But if it wasn't really much known up to that point, it was the following year. The world-famous Christie's Sale Rooms in Geneva, a prestige auction on the 26th of April 1977, featured a selection of highly collectible antique arms and armor. There was no doubt what the star items were. Not one, but seven medieval swords. I first became aware of them when the Pierre de Sale and Christie's in Geneva, and um, and obviously the, some of them were, were fairly tatty and corroded, some were in, in, in pretty good condition. I think we catalogued as uh, a group of medieval swords from the same site. The same site, in fact, as the one at Chateau de Pont. But where? No one would say. A few years later, an arms and armour expert wrote about the find, and he hinted that he knew something. The general area of the find place is known, but for reasons of security, its location may not be disclosed. Over the following years, yet more swords were sold by auctioneers across Europe. Switzerland, Germany, London, all were said to be from the same place, still unknown. Many years later, the insider expert explained the secrecy over the find site. 
In the first years of the find's existence, no mention of the actual find place was allowed. It was merely stated that it was somewhere in France. However, by the end of the 70s, this rigid secrecy had been relaxed a little, for some of us knew where the place was. We kept silence, though, for obviously someone or some authority was anxious lest treasure seekers should come looking for more. Only a few people were truly in the know. But antiques arms and armor expert David Oliver had contacts in the trade. He was able to work out approximately where the swords had come from. Just through the grapevine, one became aware that there were, I think it was first suggested to me, that came from the last major battle of the Hundred Years' War. And I didn't twig Castion. I thought there was a big battle at Orleon, I think, um, prior to Castion, so I thought it was possibly from Orleon. And then just by a process of elimination, we eventually discovered that they were actually from Castion. Not far from Bordeaux in southwest France, on the Dordogne River. The swords were from Castillon. Over the years, many more have come up for auction. There was a, there was a time that uh, there were a number of them were appearing regularly in, in, in Christie's sales. Yeah. One every few months, as it were. It's now thought as many as 80 swords were recovered. There's no other medieval battlefield with so many swords supposedly associated with it than Castillon. The swords of Castillon, such a large number of them, of course, they become part of this legend. They add considerably to something which is already dramatic just because of the people involved, um, the event and its historical importance. They are almost like sort of icing on the cake. They just make it even more remarkable. The story has captivated collectors, historians and archaeologists ever since. It is one of the amazing stories about the medieval period, the swords of Castillon. Where did they come from? They're classic medieval fighting weapons. It's, uh, it's a fantastic story. It's a, it's a wonderful yarn, <laughs> I think, um, about how these swords were, were discovered. Tim sets out to find out what he can about the swords and hopefully the circumstances of their discovery. The swords are now scattered, mostly in ones and twos, in private collections and museums across the world. But there's a rare chance to see a group of them displayed together, for perhaps the first time in decades since their finding. They're in several museums, and of course when you see them, you automatically try to imagine what it was like, one, finding them, but two, using them, which battle they're from, and so the whole, your whole of your mind starts to race. While Tim's in Paris, back in England, another of the mysterious blades has suddenly resurfaced. In the heart of Knightsbridge in the West End, Bonham's sale rooms. Another prestige auction of antiques, arms and armour, with many alluring items, medieval and otherwise, for collectors to feast their eyes on. But even though it's almost 40 years since the first auction in Geneva, the star attraction is, once again, a Castillon sword. It's expected to fetch a high price, the same every other one of its fellow swords has done over the intervening decades. I can't remember exactly when I first heard about these swords. Um, it was probably very early 70s, something like that. David Nicole, like many other medieval historians, became intrigued by the story of the swords. Whenever these swords come up in an auction, they're always the star exhibit because of the mystery of their find and, of course, their association with the Great Battle of Castillon. David has worked in the arms and armour trade, researching or provenancing items for potential sellers. But he's never, till now, come across one of the Castillon swords. I never thought I'd see them. I never thought I'd handle them. I never thought I'd have anything to do with them. The day before the sale, we were allowed special access behind the scenes. It was a chance to see the preparation that goes into such an auction. Well, you're in the auction house Bonhams, um, which was established in 1793, and you're in the sale room, which we have based in Montpellier Street in Knightsbridge, right in the heart of London. 
and we, for some years now, we've been having sales dedicated to antique arms and armour, and uh, we tend to hold between two and three sales a year. As is often the case, the sale has come about following the death of a collector. Many of the items that will be sold are from the estate of just one man. The late owner, he was an American, he had a collection. It included um, two or three medieval swords, including the Castian sword. David Nicole finally gets the opportunity to see one of the Castion swords for himself. David, so here we have lot uh, 173, the Castion sword, that's uh, coming up in our sale on Thursday. That is very nice indeed. This is a business like. Well, it's very wieldy, line. isn't it? It's very it's, wieldy. The weight is actually not that heavy. It's extremely yes. fine quality, and that's reflected in its, in its mm. general yes. wieldiness. And yes. um, you can imagine it was, it was a very useful weapon to use. Very typical of the type and the period. Very business like, as you say. Wieldy, useful. Although it has a very, f or had, should I say, a very fine edge, it's actually a very substantial piece of metal with this um, essentially trapezoid, flattened diamond section. Yes, with a medial ridge running through it, Absolutely. all the way to the tip, mm. and um, extremely beautifully made. Beautifully yeah. made, and very rigid. I mean, that's going to give you a very substantial cutting edge, but I would have thought primarily a thrusting weapon. I mean, this is... Well, to say lethal is a little bit obvious, since that's it's what very, it's, it's for. Let's see. There's a mark. Oh, there it is. It caught, the, caught my eye, caught the light. Inlays a fleur-de-lis. That is fascinating. Somehow appropriate that it should be a fleur-de-lis, although the assumption is that these were um, Anglo-Gascon. It's from the losing side in the battle. Not necessarily the case, but most probably. But nonetheless, a little French fleur-de-lis. Lovely. Interesting to speculate. Interesting to speculate, <laughs> but that brings up the whole story of the whole question of whether these really are from the Battle of Castillon. In Paris, Tim is on his way to see a whole group of the swords. Yes, finally, finally getting to see these swords will be, will be really nice. Britain's Royal Armouries own several Castillon blades, and they've loaned them out specially for this prestige auction. It has pride of place in France's premier arms and armour museum in the heart of Les Invalides in Paris, the Musée de l'Armée. And there are one or two old friends here too. How's it cool. Ah, aha. Finally, we meet. It's the first time these Royal Armoury swords have been back in France since their discovery. The Musée de l'Armée's own Castillon sword is the one that was exhibited at the Chateau de Pont, the first one the wider world came to know about. Oui, alors ces épées de Castillon, effectivement, il y en a dans, 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 un peu dans toutes les collections d'armes en Europe. Nous en avons deux ici au Musée de l'Armée et nous les avons assemblées à celle de nos collègues anglais du Royal Armouries. Eux en possèdent, en possèdent quatre. Uh, et du coup, voilà, on a assemblé uh, six pièces qui proviennent de, de Castillon. Et je pense c'est la première fois qu'il y en a, qu'il y en a autant uh, ensemble dans une exposition. But what about the circumstances of the sword's discovery? Is there anything known here in Paris about what happened back then in the Dordogne? C'est difficile de d'en de, 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 savoir plus parce que justement, elles ne sont pas issues d'une fouille régulière. Euh, et, et du coup, le, le, la personne qui les a trouvées euh, n'est pas connue. Euh, et puis tout ça, c'est toujours fait un petit peu dans la discrétion. Donc on a très très peu d'informations euh, concernant ces objets, ce qui fait qu'elles sont entourées d'une légende. C'est un peu la légende des épées de Castillon, c'est vrai. Euh, et donc c est, c est, ces objets ont une, ouais, une aura un peu particulière dans les collections. Tout le monde euh, veut posséder une épée de Castillon. Euh, et c'est pour ça qu'il y en a un peu dans, dans toutes les collections. This is the foremost military museum in France. And yet there's no record here of the recovery of some 80 swords. Archaeological relics from a medieval battle. During the past five years, a number of fine 15th century swords have been appearing in the sale room and changing hands among collectors. They're from a find of swords 
stretched from the river Dordogne, near to the site of the last battle of the Hundred Years' War, fought near Castillon in Gascony in July 1453. If the battle and the swords could be linked beyond doubt, it would be completely unique. You know where they've come from, you know roughly the date they come from, and you know which country they come from and why they're important. And if these swords are connected to the Battle of Castile in 1453, we've nailed it. Maybe it's time to look instead at the story of that battle itself. And it was a battle that didn't end well for the English. The Battle of Castile was absolutely catastrophic for the English. Uh, one of the most catastrophic, I would say actually the most catastrophic. Since the 1330s, the rulers of England and France had fought what's known to us now as the Hundred Years' War. By the early 1450s, the English had lost virtually all their possessions in France. An army was dispatched to recapture the great city of Bordeaux and its surroundings in the Dordogne, including the fortified town of Castile. It was the English coming back again, seeking to defeat the French army in battle and then hopefully re-establishing their position in southwestern France. The English commander was highly respected by both sides. Sir John Talbot was a veteran soldier. He was feared by his enemies because he was successful, he was a good leader, and he was also pretty good at getting on with the locals. And this is important because the army at Castillon was not just English, it was from Bordeaux. A large part of it was French. French loyal to the English crown, as they had been for a very long time in that region. The alliance between England and Gascony had existed for many years, before even the time of Agincourt. A representative of, uh, I think, Henry V, uh, was very proud to say that the English nation was composed of five tongues and he mentioned uh, English, Gaelic, uh, Welsh, Cornish uh, and Gascon. The French launched a preemptive strike and besieged the Gascon town of Castillon. Talbot moved fast to try and raise the French siege before Castillon fell. After marching his army through the night, he launched a headlong assault on the French position. The French had decided they were going to stand and fight, and that's precisely what they did. The English, like the French at Agincourt, and certainly like the French at Poissiers and Cressy, were full of confidence. They were incredibly confident in their ability. So they charge in there thinking, eh, they're only French, this is going to be a piece of cake. It was anything but. The French might not have had the famous English war bow, but they had overwhelming firepower of their own. The English were shot to pieces, cut down in droves by cannonballs. The survivors were charged by the French, and the English were completely routed. Some tried to make it to the Dordogne, and this is where the last stand took place. Talbot was killed, and his son, who led the rearguard. There cannot be many English commanders of the Hundred Years' War who were defeated, and yet are still commemorated on French soil. Talbot's monument looks out over the river. There was a ford here, and nearby is where, 500 years later, the swords are assumed to have been discovered. Were they dropped in the ford during the rout? How did they get into the river? In the early 1980s, an article appeared in print in which the author, our insider, pondered this very same question. The article appeared in 1982. In it, I had repeated the assumption that the swords were lost in the river by English and Gascon men-at-arms trying to get away from the battlefield having been soundly beaten by the French. The author was an English academic who was passionately interested in swords. He's one of the great figures in historical arms and armour research of the 20th century. He wrote many books and had a wide-ranging influence on a generation of future researchers. 
His name was Ewart Oakeshott. The first book that I ever came across on Arms and Armour uh, was a book by Ewart Oakeshott, one of his Night and series. Oh gosh, I must have been nine then and it wasn't, wouldn't be until about 30 odd years later that I actually ended up meeting the man. He used to, to lecture at schools and this sort of thing. He used to, he used to dress himself up in armour. He was only about five foot high. <laughs> to actually um, meet him was something I've never forgotten because I've never been served cheesecake with a Bronze Age dagger before. <laughs> uh, no, he was great. He was, he, he was, he was a real character and uh, yeah, a lovely man. It was Oakeshott who'd been the man in the know on the Castillon swords right from their discovery. He was the insider who wrote a series of articles about them. In each of his articles, the story is either found out something more, so it gets something else is added to it, and then no more numbers, or there's, we now know it was found there, or... As new anecdotal evidence emerged, Oakeshott's interpretation too steadily evolved. I was told that the 80 swords had been all together in a box or crate. The crate might have been in a wagon. This was a little more reasonable. Though how beaten troops getting the hell out of it could have stopped to pack 80 swords into a box and put it on a wagon, I don't know. Later, the crate was confirmed as being in fact two large wooden barrels, the remains of which had been found with the swords. As Oakeshott said, this didn't sound like fleeing troops throwing away their weapons in the river. Are there clues in what we know about the aftermath of medieval battle? Back at the battlefield, of course, you've got a load of mixed and in some cases extremely valuable military equipment lying around. Now, booty is absolutely central to motivation of medieval armies because they're not paid very well, if paid at all. So if you win, survive unhurt, you can make a lot of money by collecting the stuff that's lying around. And there's going to be merchants, arms merchants, those people we all love, hovering around in the background, ready to come in and buy up this stuff. It's an odd parallel that half a millennia later, the Castillon swords are still highly sought after by dealers in arms. Today, it's not just private collectors who buy antique arms and armor. Like any other consumer, if there's an item the Royal Armouries want for their collection, they have to buy it from a dealer. In their storerooms in Leeds, Tim gets a rare chance to see at first hand the Armoury's six Castillon blades. When did the swords first come into the Royal Armouries collection then? The, the swords have come into the armories over a period of time, starting from about 1977 and through the 80s. And they have been acquired through either auction or from dealers. And what's interesting as a group is there's similarities and their differences. So there are none that are identical? None of them are going to be identical because they're all, of course, hand forged. A different person might make the pommel and the cross as opposed to the blade, even if they were for you know, a contract, like, we know about places like the Tower issuing arms, don't we, for campaigns. So even if they were to fulfil that function, there's still going to be differences. We don't even know, to be honest, whether these are French or English. All oh, right. <laughs> right. So there's nothing here stylistically. It, 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 they, they could have been used basically all over the continent. Ewart Oakeshott recognised the variations in the swords from his wide-ranging surveys of surviving medieval weapons. These Royal Armouries blades conform to his initial grouping by three broad types. Of the 80 supposedly out there, they fall into, most fall into three categories. The powerful looking Type A swords are the most numerous in the group. This one here um, being the largest category and is referred to as Type A, and it has this tapering, cut and thrust diamond section, sometimes with the hollowed out sides of the blade as well, and this downturned cross and heavy wheel pommel. Fewer in number than the Type A's, the Type B's differ very slightly in design, but they still have the same recognisable characteristics. That would be your classic Type B with the fishtail pommel, the straight cross with the bulbous ends, and the 
gradually tapering diamond section blade. So more of a, more of a thrusting specific weapon. And then the smallest group of which I think is a group of two is the type C ones. And that's with this pear shaped or you know, scent stopper pommel, similar cross to type B's and then triple fullered into diamond section blades. Another of the armory's collection can be included in a third group, group C. What I find very interesting is, is this falchion type. It's also a very, very, very fine falchion. It's not a sort of typical falchion like, like a clubbing sword. One, one, is it? No. It's, it is definitely a fine sword, but you, it's definitely a falchion as you, well. You think of uh, perhaps, well, you can think of some certainly earlier falchions that were always being uh, like a machete. Um, that, as you say, is very, very fine. It's very delicate, and the clipped tip as you can see, is, 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 is quite exquisite, the line on it. A falchion was a medieval slashing weapon. This single sword is perhaps the rarest of the whole Castillon group. This is a gold decoration on the blade. It could actually be a custom-made one-off, and there is n none other like it. Well, apparently, out of, out of the apparent 80 that were known, um, this is the only falchion type. So, Medieval falchions overall are incredibly yeah. rare surviving. Right. Despite being quite, quite uh, often shown in art and things like that, actual physical surviving specimens. It's the compact Type A sword that Tim's drawn to. Oh, that's uh, yeah, that's really heavy. But if you look at the medieval manuscripts, you quite often see this very typical, very yeah. bl broad blade this end and very fine at the other end. And even some of the tombs have got swords yes. engraved on that are very similar to this. Variants of this type occur almost right through the 15th century. So I've seen so many illustrations, but to hold it and feel the weight of it, I mean, that is... The form you know. is, a, is a classic yeah, yeah. fighting sword. It's yeah. But is there any archaeological evidence on the blades that might tell us more about their use? Maybe in a battle, even Castillon. In your opinion, do these look as though they've been used? Some of them are on the edges of the blades appear to give evidence of having been used, shall we say. But... Um, one might see those actually as just um, corrosion products. Whether a nick started it or whether it is just a corrosion product is hard to say. Yeah, that's interesting. Isn't it? Again, it's got a line across there. Yes, I just it's, noticed that in this light, actually. Similar to that one, isn't it? Turn it is over it? and just see if there's a similar line on the other yeah. side. I wonder if that's the length of the... Oh, there is, Luke. There is. Uh, Perfect. No. Yes, there is. So that's how long the scabbards were. That's interesting. They didn't go right to the hilt. No, you'd have your metal mount. Yeah, 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 yeah. corrosion. Yeah. Wow, I don't that's, uh, that's quite nice. I think that's a new spot, isn't it? Several of the 80 swords, and now this one, show evidence that they were scabbarded when they went into the water. Does this help with trying to work out how they came to be there? One of the main questions is, uh, what this collection is all about. Is it a collection of swords that was going to a battle? Is this collection of swords that was been, had been looted off the battlefield afterwards, collected up and then taken away from the battlefield? Uh, and so is there any evidence that the style and the type and anything else could answer that question? The only thing that's always struck me is I find, it, hopefully with going to battle, they, they would be treated well. So you have silver decorated pommels, you have gold on the blades bustling and jostling, if you like, alongside common soldier's sword, maybe. And I find that a bit odd, but I can imagine if it's being an after-the-battle scenario, everything is being bundled and jumbled together. Mm. Because they don't belong to anybody anymore. That's right. They've yes. just been taken yes. away yeah. and pillaged, yes. basically. These six swords are like the whole of the Castillon group. Some expensive blades, some less so. Some may be used in battle, some probably not, and some at least scabbarded. So does it sound like they were looted or something else? We know they were in a river, or we yes, presume they were yes, in a river. Yeah. But we don't know, and that, that's the thing. If we knew how, how they were actually found, their groupings even may be able to... We, it could be that the, the, the swords that have similar pommels were all grouped together. We don't know. Were they in fact battle-related, or is it possible these are similar because this was a dealer in swords and this was his collection and for some reason he got swamped in a river and lost the lot. David Oliver too 
has come to favour this possible explanation. The reason why, one of the reasons why I think they're not battlefield finds is that because they're so many are virtually, they're not identical, but of the same type. So to my mind, there have been supplies from a, a maker or a, a supplier of, uh, of munitions, um, which have been going to either Castillon, Bergerac or wherever, and just happened to be lost coincidentally in the Castillon region. Can we even say the Battle of Castillon had any connection at all to the swords, given what the physical evidence tells us? You as an archaeologist are more aware of this than, than perhaps others. That there was a battle just <laughs> up the road from the alleged find site, so therefore these swords must be associated from the battle. Uh, actually, there is no evidence for that. But given the traffic, it's a very busy river. It, yeah. it, it, it could just be total coincidence. Back in London, another of the Castillon swords prepares to meet a new owner. It's nearly time for the sale. Bonhams have never before sold a Castillon sword. With less than 24 hours to go, anticipation is building. The starting price of the piece is £8,000. Arms and armour collecting is a popular market. You're selling into a, 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 an educated audience, if you like, and um, yes, they, they appreciate the work uh, of, uh, you know, the quality of work, and they appreciate the rarity, and they appreciate the fact that they have a historical connection very often. So, lots of anticipation about tomorrow? Let's hope so, we're going to see. <laughs> Auctions like these are vital for museums to acquire their exhibits, but the arms and armour trade sometimes gets a bad press. Sometimes I, I uh, tell my friends oh, I'm, I'm off to an arms fair tomorrow or something and they seem to think I'm going to go off and buy a, a jet fighter. And of course it's actually it's an antiques or antique arms fair. The academic world can get a little bit sniffy about the whole commercial sales, buying and selling of these beautiful and interesting objects. And personally, I, I feel that's most unfair. By encouraging and spreading this interest, they bring in artefacts which we might otherwise not see, which the academics might not see, like the Castillon swords. Swords themselves have a mystique, I think. Um, there's, there's something about them um, that elevates them above all other weapons, I think. Like David Nicole, Clive Thomas researches and writes about historical items in the arms and armour trade. And he too is fascinated by the Castillon swords. Yeah, the first time I um, actually got to grips with a medieval sword uh, was actually one of the Castillon pieces. It was, uh, it was just superb and uh, I, was, I, I felt very privileged to, uh, to be holding it. I think at that point, that was when uh, my, uh, my interest in the Castillon group um, was really sparked, I suppose. Clive was well versed in the work of Ewart Oakshot. I was first aware of Ewart Oakshot when, uh, when I read his book, The Archaeology of Weapons. I still dip into it occasionally just for the sheer pleasure of reading it. Um, much later, I, uh, I actually met the man and um, I, I met him probably probably four or five times before he died, which was, I think, in 2002. What was he like? <laughs> very, 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 he was very enthusiastic about the subject, basically. Uh, very friendly, very, um, very approachable. And uh, I, I remember when, uh, the, the very first time I actually met him, I, uh, I, I was introduced to him by a, a, ch a chap from the Arms and Armour Society. And um, this guy took me over to Ewart um, at the Park Lane Arms Fair, this was, and, uh, and, and said, this guy's just written an article which you've got to see. And, uh, and, and knew it, opened the article up, said, oh, I say, you know. And uh, there we were <laughs> chatting away like we'd been old friends for, for decades, you know. Ewart Oakshot passed away in 2002. Over almost three decades, he'd written numerous articles and books about the Castillon Blades. Yet the story wasn't complete and still the swords kept appearing for auction. There were still blanks to be filled in. After Ewart died, uh, I, was, um, I was looking through these articles and I thought, well, I think, I think um, somebody really needs to pull it all together. And, you know, there was definitely a sense of a, a, a baton being passed, I think. Clive continued the work of Ewart Oakshot 
by starting out with his own research. His aim was to try to establish the true chain of events. It still wasn't known for sure when or even how the find occurred. He was able to establish some of this. As, as far as I know, we pinned the year down to 1974 when they were discovered. Um, they were discovered by, uh, I think, a dredging company, as far as, as far as we can tell, anyway. But where the dredging happened was another matter. Nobody seemed to know or want to tell. Even Oakshot himself was coy on the matter in his articles. The general area of the fine place is known, though for reasons of security, location, its location may not be disclosed. It, it was as if he couldn't really um, tell you everything but he, uh, he sort of cheated. He, he, put, he put just enough information in there just, to, uh, to, just so anybody in the know could actually uh, determine roughly where these things were found. There was a clue that the swords were found near a ford. And this, along with the apparent date and type of the swords, is how they came to be associated with the battle. It's often thought that the, um, that the fine point was actually near the site of the battle, the 1453 battle. In actual fact, it was the other side of the, of the town, uh, further downstream. This changed everything. Not the ford of Razan, which was close to the battlefield, but the ford of Jean Bar, just under a kilometer to the southwest. If true, this put paid once and for all to the idea of defeated English soldiers losing their swords in the ford as they fled. Clive found that Oakshot seemed to be being fed snippets of detail about the find. He let slip clues in his articles. It's interesting from the first articles um, where it was said that the, that the swords were found in a, in a wagon or something like that. Um, and then he revised that in the following article um, to say that they were found in some casks um, and later said that they were found in a barge. It's amazing seeing how the story develops a plausible picture began to emerge. Perhaps the swords have been collected after the battle, but it could have been before, or even years later. The swords were of types in use for much of the 15th century. They'd been loaded on board the river barge for transportation. By English or Gascon or by French troops, we don't know. Were they heading up or down river? Were they loaded around here Perhaps spoils from the battle, we don't know. We do know, though, that valuable swords, packed together in a shipment, perhaps in great barrels below decks, would have been a serious commodity in the medieval arms trade of the Hundred Years' War. But just how did they come to be in the river? Right up to his very last words in print on the subject, Oakshot himself wondered this. For all any of us know, other things from that boat may lurk beneath the water. But why did the barge sink? Clive came up with something no one else had. The Dordogne is one of France's largest rivers, and it bears witness to an incredible and potentially destructive natural force. A tidal bore, a surge of water driven by the sea. I was quite surprised, actually, when I learned of this, of this particular uh, natural phenomenon that um, that nobody had actually had actually mentioned it in any of the uh, the literature on on Castillon beforehand. So I did a bit of research on it, and um, the way that tidal bores work, um, the one at Castillon is actually known as the Masqueray, and uh, it goes all the way up the Dordogne to a point about well se several kilometres further than than Castillon itself. There would have been little warning. The tidal bore makes hardly any sound until it hits. If they weren't prepared, or if it was unusually strong, the masquerade might easily have swamped or sunk a small craft. The barge and its cargo might also have drifted some distance before they sank into the mud of the Dordogne. I find it very interesting that, uh, that None of that information uh, was ever mentioned by anyone beforehand, really. In fact, why was so little known about the whole find? Even Ewart Oakshot stated that he had to keep quiet on the matter. 
was. We kept silence though, Someone. for some authority was anxious, lest treasure seekers should come looking for more. Again, Clive came up with an explanation. I, I suspect the, the authority that, uh, that, that you had mentioned was probably the French Navy. At that point, there was a law in France which said that uh, anything discovered in the river um, had to be investigated by them. Castillon isn't too far from France's Atlantic coast and a major naval base at Bordeaux. In the early 70s, this was the height of the Cold War, so the French Navy had to be thorough. I have it from various uh, sources that they uh, they didn't just um, do a watching brief as such. They, uh, they, they, took, they actually took pictures in the water, cordoned off an area, um, did a proper search. But uh, quite what they learned is, um, uh, is open to question because uh, none of that information is, uh, is currently available. Until it becomes available, if ever, we'll never know if the 80 recovered swords were the only ones nor whether anything else of the barge and its cargo remains undiscovered. At Bonhams of Knightsbridge, the auction reaches its climax with lot number 173, the Castillon Sword. The starting price of £8,000 is quickly left behind. In the end, it takes just 35 seconds. 12000 is. £12,000 and another of the extraordinary Castillon swords has a new owner. What would you at Oakshot have made of all this? I think uh, you at Oakshot would be delighted with the interest that is being given to these swords. And he'd be fascinated by the fact that more keep popping up because he realised that this was not um, a straightforward case. It was a, an ongoing story. And um, uh, maybe he's up there thinking, hey, keep at it, you're doing well, there's still questions to answer. There's little doubt, though, that if it all happened again today, things would be very different. I can't help but imagine what it would be like if somebody had found those swords today. It would be phenomenal, it would be unbelievable. We'd now know hardly anything about the swords of Castillon were it not for the arms and armour trade. And collectors and experts like David Oliver, who commissioned the articles by Ewart Oakeshott and Clive Thomas. But all the, all the academic institutions use your articles as a reference? Well, it's nice to think so. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's one, of the, uh, one of the objects of the exercise, that these are, are, are works of reference. You know, that's something which you just look at and throw away. It's, you know, they, they are retained. And, I mean, people are kind enough to, to refer to, to our articles, to our catalogues, in, auction catalogues and, um, and articles and books which are, which are written on the subject. So hopefully it serves a purpose. It, uh, it, it, be it beggars belief now completely um, uh, as to how it was done. It, it just wouldn't happen these days. Um, and, uh, but, but, but the whole story, it, it, it provides a, a, a really intriguing sort of mystery, I suppose. We've now had 40 odd years and the fact there's still a mystery to this story 40 years on, uh, I don't think it's a good sign. I, I, I'll be optimistic and hope it will be resolved. I want it to be resolved, but maybe this is a mystery that will just go on and on. <laughs> One day, uh, I hope somebody is going to do a proper archaeological investigation of the site.